Because it's an open case, the researchers cannot reveal the nature of the alleged crime or the details of the research they are conducting. Thirty seconds away. They do, however, agree to give us a rare behind-the-scenes look at the process in action. Well, that was quick. In one of the lab's three test cells, carpenters have built a full-scale replica of the room involved in the blaze. But before setting fire to it, Stephen Hill and his team first have to run an even more basic test. They need to find a predictable, quantifiable way to reproduce the so-called fuel load of the original blaze, the combustible material, in this case furniture, that fed the fire. As their unit of measurement, they use standard wooden pallets. It was just going to be easier to try to get a fuel that's very repeatable in a laboratory environment, um, but that would behave in a similar fashion as a piece of upholstered furniture. Ignition. ATF firefighters start the test by igniting two stacks of wooden pallets. As the pallets burn, the gases they produce are drawn up into a hood above the test cell floor. There, instruments connected to a central computer measure the amount of oxygen, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide the fire gives off. Using that data, the computer then calculates precisely how much heat the fire releases at any point in time. It takes a total of eight pallets to give the engineers the fuel load they are looking for, three megawatts or three million times the energy of a hundred watt light bulb. Having settled the fuel load question, Hill and his team move to the largest of the lab's test cells for the main event. Um, from that point on, we're just, we don't know what's going to happen, that's why we're doing this test, right? Firefighters place the pallets inside the structure, a room with no windows. Five, four, three, two, one. Once the fire is lit, instruments register up to 2,000 points of data per second. Sensors called thermocouples constantly monitor the temperature inside the structure. Digital photographs along with five video cameras document the test. The purpose of the experiment is to find out if this fuel load can generate enough heat to ignite a room this size in the absence of any oxygen flow. Within minutes, smoke is billowing out of the room, but no flames. Twenty more minutes pass, and the temperature inside the room climbs past 600 degrees, but still no flames. Finally, at the 28-minute mark, got flames in the, roof. the engineers get the answer they're looking for. Once the test is complete, They'll send the raw data to the agent working on the case. They'll also add it to the lab's own growing database. It's all part of the effort to shore up the science of fire investigation and to give investigators the ammunition they need when they testify in court. Matching a bullet to a gun, it's one of the oldest weapons in the forensics arsenal. So why is firearms analysis itself now in the crosshairs? When police on TV say, send it to ballistics, Kristen Gerber's job is what they have in mind. Gerber is a firearms examiner at the ATF crime lab in Maryland. She's an expert at reading the microscopic markings found on fired bullets. I look at ammunition components to determine whether or not a particular bullet came from a particular firearm to the exclusion of all others. Developed in the early 20th century, firearms analysis is one of the oldest and most established fields in forensics. Following the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, investigators used the technique to match shell casings found at the scene to a machine gun linked to a member of Al Capone's gang. Today, crime labs in the US process tens of thousands of requests for firearms analysis annually. 
but in recent years, critics have attacked the technique, citing it as unreliable evidence and unproven science. So why, after nearly a century, is firearms analysis itself under fire? To answer that question, we need to understand how the technique works. And to do that, we first have to know what happens when a gun is fired. When the trigger is pulled, it releases the firing pin, which explodes a charge on the back of the bullet. As the bullet is propelled forward, it expands, causing it to scrape against the inside of the barrel. During this process, imperfections in the metal of the barrel imprint themselves on the bullet, leaving a pattern of microscopic scratches called striations on its surface. The central premise of firearms analysis is that every gun leaves its own unique pattern on all the bullets it fires. Finding and identifying such patterns is the speciality of firearms examiners like Kristen Gerber. In a typical case, she analyzes two pieces of evidence, a suspect firearm and a bullet recovered from a crime scene. To determine whether they match, she first fires a test bullet from the gun into a tank of water. Next, she examines that bullet alongside the evidence bullet to see if she can find any shared patterns. This is a comparison microscope, and this piece of equipment allows you to look at two images at the same time. And on the screen, you'll see that there's a hairline, and this allows me to look at the two images together. The striations Gerber is looking at are around five microns wide approximately one-tenth the width of a human hair. It's up to her to decide which striations are meaningful and which patterns to compare. The two patterns are extremely similar. There are no objective standards to guide Gerber's analysis, no consensus on how many striations need to line up to constitute a match. It all comes down to the judgment of whoever's at the microscope. It is up to the examiner's eye. At the end of the examination, most examiners are gonna to come to the same conclusion. And that's based on training and experience. But on the witness stand, training and experience may no longer be enough. In the wake of the Supreme Court's 1993 Daubert decision, judges have started demanding that an expert's testimony be grounded in solid, verifiable science. We don't do trust me in courts. The issue is what are the standards for that judgment? What are the tests for that judgment? How do we review that judgment? The problem is that firearms analysis relies on pattern recognition, a skill that is inherently subjective. The work that goes on often is in, ultimately, the examiner's head. What's the formula for that? There isn't one. So how do you prove that there's more to firearms analysis than the eye of the examiner? Benjamin Backrack might have the answer. Backrack is an electrical engineer and vice president of a high-tech research firm. In the spring of 2006, he completed a federally funded study designed to show that firearms analysis rests on solid scientific footing and that courts should continue to allow examiners like Kristen Gerber to testify. What the National Institute of Justice wanted us to show was that the comparison of bullets could be substantiated uh, numerically in a quantifiable manner. Backrack and his team began by using a 3D photo microscope to scan hundreds of bullets test fired from dozens of different guns. The microscope captures a 360 degree topographical image of each bullet, a relief map where the peaks and valleys represent the scratches on the bullet's surface. That data is fed into a computer which goes through two by two and compares the topography of every bullet to every other bullet. Finally, the computer assigns each pair a score based on their degree of similarity an objective way of evaluating how closely they match. The human operator has very little to do with the process. So there's very little subjectivity 
There are very few ways in which a user could affect the process. In the end, 